Welcome, good morning, and good afternoon, Eaton Nation. I am Josh Kingsley, and I am back at my hosting post for today's Ask the Expert event. And today, we're going to be taking your questions about the topic of harmonics. So let's meet our expert for today. Please say hello to the director of Eaton's Power Systems Experience Center, Mr. Dan Carnavali. Hey, Josh, and welcome to everybody out there. Yeah, welcome, Dan. Thank you for being here. And also a big thanks to Eaton Nation for coming out strong with all the pre-comments and results to the polls that we've got. That's uh, going to really help us give you guys a great experience today. We're going to start with our normal housekeeping to our audience. You can ask your questions via the comment sections below on both the LinkedIn and Facebook profiles. So thanks for joining us live there. And also as an added bonus, you will be able to download a free white paper called Harmonic Solutions Explained, and it's going to provide an in-depth look at harmonics, the causes, the impact, and most importantly, as you've told us emphatically, the solutions. So we will show you how to get your free white paper at the conclusion of this. So please stick around as always to the end. And this Ask the Expert session is brought to you by Eaton's PowerXL EGP 18 Pulse Variable Frequency Drive. Please visit eaton.com slash EGP to explore the portfolio. All righty, let's get right into the questions. And our first one is going to be coming from Jacob on LinkedIn. And so I'm going to um, phrase this the best way that I possibly can. What are harmonics and why are they bad? Where do you start with harmonic analysis to know if you even have to worry about harmonics if you're putting in a VFD? So Dan, um, how would you answer that? Josh, great way to start. And Jacob, thanks for the question. Um, Where do you start with harmonics? First of all, what do we know about harmonics? Uh, Again, distortion on the voltage and current waveform. Where do they come from? We're going to actually take a look at you know, where harmonics come from. So let me just draw it out here. I love to have my little drawing tablet here. Um, you know, what happens is that people put in motors and um, they decide to switch over and put in a variable frequency drive or they put in other loads like, you know, fluorescent lighting or LED lighting or whatever. And then all of a sudden harmonics show up in their system. So where they come from is actually from the loads. So let's take a look at an example with the drive. Um, we have, you know, a motor that may be a hundred horsepower motor and we have some harmonics that are generated by the drive and we'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. We're gonna say those harmonics come out of the drive or out of the electronic load and they flow back up through the system. And as all currents do, currents wanna to flow to the path of least impedance. So they flow back up through the system and through the transformer. Now, what's really interesting about harmonics is it seems overly complicated, but it's really just Ohm's law. Voltage equals current times impedance is Ohm's law. And when we start without the drive, we have an equation that looks like this. Voltage distortion equals current distortion times harmonic impedance. And basically for the first scenario where we don't have a drive, voltage distortion equals zero because current distortion equals zero. But as we add more and more current distortion here, here, in other words, let's say we go from 10 amps maybe with one drive to 100 amps with multiple drives of of different frequencies, fifth harmonic. And again, we'll come back to a little bit of that we add more and more voltage distortion. So again, we start out with a relatively clean sine wave in terms of voltage. We draw a current that doesn't look like the voltage. We call that nonlinear load. And that nonlinear load, that current doesn't look like the voltage. That current pushing back up through the system then actually causes voltage distortion. So voltage distortion comes from current distortion. The more current distortion we have, the more voltage distortion we get. And again, Great question to start with because harmonic currents come from the loads. Harmonic voltage distortion ends up being part of the, um, you know, the the end result of that. And so then, you know, the next step is how do you figure out what the solutions are and, you know, how do you model the system if you need to, to determine what's the best solution for it. And I'll tell you one little secret is just because you have a drive and you have some harmonics in the system doesn't always mean you have a problem. So the problems result from current distortion causing you know, heating and things through the system, which again, we can address in other questions maybe, but voltage distortion causing this operation. So we look at this from a problem and solution standpoint, and, and that's really a good starting point. So Jake, thanks for the question. Yeah, and also a big shout to Vian and Hamid, who were part of the chat that I referenced at the beginning, who pretty much asked the same, same questions to help define harmonics. So let's jump to our next one, which is coming from Alex on LinkedIn. 
And what he's asking is uh, fairly related. So this should, this should follow pretty well. What are the key harmonic solutions for VFDs and how do you decide which one to pick? Again, that's Alex. That's a great question because um, if you think about it, as I mentioned, you know, and I'll go back to my, I'll use the drawing tablet here, but if I put my drive on here and I say that I have harmonics coming out of my drive and I'm simplifying this, obviously it could be multiple drives, could be multiple different harmonic loads, whatever they happen to be. Um, but as that current comes out of the drive and it wants to go somewhere, we have to either find a new path for it to go through that's a lower impedance, going back to that voltage distortion equals current distortion times harmonic impedance, or we can actually limit that current from coming out. So what are some of the solutions? Some of the solutions I would start with um, line, uh, you know, DC chokes built into the drive or line reactor built into the drive or an additional line reactor in front of the drive and what that does is basically constricts the current. So uh, I always think of it and think about it like water going through a hose, coming through the hose. If I constrict that hose, you know, we've all kind of pinched a hose together, you get a kind of a higher pressure out the other end, but we're really limiting the flow through there. So by putting a drive here with a line reactor or a DC choke built in, we take a current that looks something like this, and we, we end up having a current that looks more rounded off and the harmonic pattern that's associated with that is, is much less. In other words, we have a lot less distortion. So if in the first case, we didn't have a reactor, we had 20 amps of say fifth harmonic current. With the second case, we might have you know, 10 amps of fifth harmonic current. And that, and that actually is a very, it's probably the least expensive version of um, you know, things. So like our drives, our DG1s, for example, and our other variable frequency drives have uh, DC chokes built right in and 5% and is kind of the right number for that. Um, as you look at other things, we talked about if we try to take the current and make it go somewhere else, we could actually put a filter over here. So a filter looks like a reactor and a capacitor in series. And at a particular frequency, let's say this fifth harmonic current, when this current gets to this point, current wants to divide and go according to impedance. So if this was ideally zero ohms, guess what? Current that's even if it's 100 amps, times harmonic impedance, if this is zero ohms, then our voltage distortion goes back to zero. In reality, it's not gonna be zero, but this is how harmonic currents flow through the system. And most times when you make a filter like this, half of the current or so goes this way, half goes this way. So those are kind of two things that you could do. The other thing is to select perhaps the right drive. Uh, you know, we talk about 18 pulse clean power type drives. Um, our medium voltage drives, perhaps 24 pulse to keep that limit down to uh, you know, a, a reasonable level. Um, and then you, know, you, you go all the way up through you know, broadband filters in front of the drives and active front ends and so forth. So there's a lot of different solutions. And, and honestly, that's why we put the paper together because it can be kind of confusing and it all comes back to a couple of things, really the technical advantages that you have and, and the cost. And we've put a bunch of um, frequently asked questions around those and made some videos around that as well. So those references are, those, uh, are available for you as well. So essentially you're trying to diagnose what exactly the problem is, where it's coming from, what kind of budget you have to have for solutions, and then you're going to have a, a bevy of options. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, Josh, it's like being a, you know, like a power quality doctor. We use that analogy because it's, um, you know, if, if you go to the doctor and you say, hey, doc, I have a problem, he doesn't automatically just throw a cast on your leg. He says, well, what are your symptoms? And if you look at the symptoms here, and I have a lot of heating and stuff associated with that, I know I have to deal with the current. If I have a lot of voltage distortion, I know I have to deal with the voltage. And so we kind of look at it as, as applying the right solution, um, you know, according to what you need in your system. And sometimes doing nothing, you know, the least expensive solution sometimes is the right solution. Um, it just depends. So harmonics are kind of that new normal that we have to deal with. Got it. So let's uh, let's walk down that path a little bit. When when a solution is correct to do nothing, um, kind of paint a picture of how you determine that it's not as big of a problem as as you think it is. Yeah, um, I'll start with another a thought here. Like, so let's let's say we have, um, you know, again, somebody wants to convert their their warehouse. And they they put a bunch of um, BFDs and, you know, they're originally running motors on a conveyor system. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you put in one drive and two drives and three drives. So you convert all these motors over to have BFDs. At what point do you have a problem? There, there's some rules of thumb that we go by. You know, sometimes if you look at the KVA of this transformer, let's say a thousand KVA, um, if you get to the point where about 20% of your load on that transformer 
is uh, harmonic type load, then maybe you know you start to do some more formal analysis instead of doing um, just you know kind of the back of the envelope kind of thing. Um, so you know twenty percent of the you know full load of that, which is going to relate to both the voltage and current kind of issues. Um, if you look at um, you know this bus here and you're looking at the voltage here, this this is where harmonics are a self-infecting problem, right? So the more you put down here, the more you distort the voltage on the bus. So you go from a nice clean sine wave to something that's distorted. And as you distort the bus and you determine that I'm now having problems with some of my loads in my system. Again, it, it's it, the, the one thing, Josh, about those uh, uh, harmonics is it's not as cut and dried as some other power issues. And, um, you know, some gray areas exist, obviously. And for one situation, maybe in a, an industrial plant, you can live with a lot of harmonics. Maybe for a hospital with MRI machines, you can just have a little bit. Um, so as an example. So going back to that diagnosis, you need to know what your loads are doing and what the potential failure could be. And so a little bit of nuisance tripping every once in a while in an industrial facility might be dealt with, but an MRI tripping ever is probably a bad situation. But, yeah, exactly. Got it. You, you also mentioned that those were self-infecting problems where you could be uh, harming your own power source that you have. Is there such thing as a problem that doesn't infect yourself, but infects something else? Well, that's actually where the IEEE standard comes in. Um, when you think about um, if you take, and I go back to um, a scenario where um, you, you have your transformer here and you know, you're feeding your loads or whatever. And then on, you know, on the same system, we have, um, you know, another utility customer and you could literally be affecting um, those guys by your harmonics. And that's where the IEEE standard comes in at that point of common coupling where, where they have to be kind of the mediators. A um, couple examples, Josh, that would be that I think of when I think of that, I, I, I ran into a situation where, you know, there was a ski lift and they had to drive on the ski lift. And as, you know, they added more and more things to the top of this hill, um, you know, more and more people were riding the ski lift. All of a sudden, the, the people in the really nice houses at the top of the hill with the ski lift, their lights were flickering. And so it was kind of affecting them with this, this ski lift. So the answer is what? Turn off the ski lift and not have people go up and down the hill or maybe put some kind of filtering in to, to absorb those harmonics or send them back to the load. Because current always has to flow out of the load and then back to the load where, um, where voltage you know, we can deal with in other ways. Um, another scenario related to that was I saw somebody, this was back when people were replacing fluorescent lights a lot they replaced like half of their fluorescent lights in a big commercial building, like 12 story building. And as they got about halfway through, those lights started to flicker. And so now you're thinking, okay, I got halfway through all of my lights that I just put in, even though I'm saving money with them from an efficiency standpoint, they're starting to flicker. So now I have another problem and that's where, again, you have to start to deal with it. So it could be you affecting yourself, you affecting your neighbor or in the big scale things, you know, like that steel mill affecting the hospital on a big scale and the utility has to deal with it. Yeah, and the utility um, is probably really interested in playing mediator in situations like a ski lift probably, and people yeah. that are living on top of a mountain. Okay, let's get into our next question. We're going back to the uh, LinkedIn, and we're specifically going to go to the chat that we had uh, putting putting this together at the beginning. And so Brian Souter asked a question, and I'm going to try and paraphrase this as much as I possibly can. So the first things he, he's asking is, what's the relationship between the existence of harmonics in a three-phase system and apparent neutral currents? And so to uh, throw a couple of the factors that he's throwing out, um, he's got the equipment properly grounded and he's seeing high neutral currents at both the medium voltage switch gear and the downstream 480 VAC side, even though the plant technically does not have a four wire system, which would be the three phase plus the neutral, but he's seeing the, the high neutral comments or uh, currents coming in at his uh, SEL 51 a relays and Siemens WLS uh, 480 volt switch gear. And the problem has been bad enough that the breakers are causing erroneous ground trip faults. So um, Siemens had them put in EMI filters. I know there's a ton of stuff going on there. If you can kind of help unpack, um, what we can do to uh, talk about this and maybe comment on, on the Siemens proposed solution and what your thoughts are on that. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot in there. And Brian, what I'll do is I, now that I'm looking at that question, um, I'll reach out to you after this and, and give you more specifics, but I'm gonna kind of address your question um, the best I can just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of, of some of the stuff. So if we look at, you know, 
a three phase system and we have you know three phases going out and a neutral um what what you're referencing was you know if i have loads on each phase um connected to neutral um you were talking about zero sequence a little bit like those um you know if we have let's say phase a 10 amps 10 amps on phase b 10 amps on phase c if that's 60 hertz current because it's all displaced by 120 degrees we have 10 amps plus 10 amps plus 10 amps in the neutral here we get zero um, but what's interesting is you mentioned zero sequence so if i have um, let's say five amps or you know 10 amps or whatever of third harmonic or zero sequence um, that current is actually additive on the neutral. And so when it gets back to this point, it's one, two, three, and it adds up to be 15 amps in this case. That's why people historically have doubled neutrals and stuff like that. Um, now, when you look at how things go, um, this, what, what you're referencing is, you're talking about a medium voltage system and a 480 volt system that doesn't have a neutral. So in this case, we're not talking about those type of low frequency, in this case, third harmonic, for example, zero sequence harmonics. What you're talking about, I think, is some of the higher frequency harmonics. And those can come from sometimes the outputs of VFDs, the, the pulse width modulated output. And we don't, usually don't think about harmonics from coming from the output of the drive. The drive is a rectifier, DC bus with a capacitor and a uh, inverter. And the pulse width modulation on this output that high frequency stuff, sometimes I've seen, you know, if the input current looks like that double hump current that I drew earlier, the output current um, can have some 39th harmonic, like really high order third harmonic. So again, I'll get back to you on some of the details of that, but where I've seen this in larger industrials is the influence of those currents coming through, not the conductors themselves, because there are no conductors in your situation, but the capacitance to ground they can follow that capacitive path, especially the higher frequencies. And that's why the EMI filter was recommended likely. And, it, and it, if it took care of the problem, that would make sense because you're actually putting a, a conductor in parallel with that capacitance to ground. So much, you know, very complicated kind of situation, but um, I'll definitely reach out to you and talk through the details of the answer to that. Oh, well, by uh, the way, before I forget, sorry, Josh. Um, one of the things that that does affect on 480 volt system is this high resistance grounded systems you can see that on the voltage measurement on the um, on the HRG system. If you measure current, a lot of times you can filter that out or not see that um, and just look at the 60 hertz part. But if you're looking at voltage to ground, um, sometimes you will see that pick up. Got it. Thank you, Dan. And, and hopefully that gets us down the path to a right question, Brian. Um, do us all a favor and check your email. Our Eaton Electrical Services and Systems team uh, is going to be reaching out to you to discuss this further. They'll be able to set up a time. So, I mean, this is the uh, Ask the Experts session, and we, we truly have an expert on here with Dan, but we also have experts um, outside that can, can help, and that's what they're there for. So be looking for a note from them. All right, the uh, questions are coming in fast and furious, but the producers are in my ear as normal, reminding me to tell you that this episode of Ask the Expert is brought to you by the Power XL EGP 18 Pulse VFD. Visit eaton.com slash EGP to learn more about the product. And Dan, let's jump back into the questions. And it looks like this one's coming in. We're going to jump over to Facebook, give some love to them. And this one's coming from Ardeth. And this looks like a good one as well. And we've touched on this a little bit, but can we get a little more specific into, is there a way to select a VFD so you can avoid harmonic problems? Yeah, that, um, hey, Ardeth, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, whether it's a drive or really any electronic load, let's say, you know, again, LED lights or whatever. Um, we say that those, those electronic loads have characteristic harmonics. So I've been drawing this current that looks like this, and I'm gonna back up a little bit and explain that a little bit more. Um, this current has a 60 Hertz component and it has other frequencies that added together kind of with superposition add up to be that waveform. And so like it might have a fifth harmonic and it might have a seventh harmonic. And you say, well, how do you know which frequencies those are? So fifth harmonic is five times 60 or 300 Hertz. How do you know what, what that waveform would have? There's a kind of a nice, easy calculation here. It's NP plus or minus one. So when we have six pulse drives, that's six, N is just an integer, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and, and then so it's one times six plus or minus one, which would give us 
fifth and seventh, and then two times six plus or minus one, which gives us 11th and 13th, and three times so 17th and 19th. So if I were to take that same equation and say, now I have an 18 pulse drive, so what would be my predominant harmonic I would have? It would almost look like I have a nice clean sine wave, and I would actually have 18 plus or minus one, 17th and 19th, and then two times 18 plus or minus one, so 35th. You're stretching my math here, Josh. And our death, um, 35th and 37th. Um, but anyway, when I do all that, and I look at the frequency spectrum. So if this is, um, if this is magnitude, and we'll call the fundamental 100%, so the fundamental being 60 hertz, I would have 5th and 7th and 11th and 13th. And 17th and 19th what you notice is those frequencies as they go up in frequency the magnitude of the harmonic goes down so this is fifth seventh 11th 13th 17th 19th and so forth now when i draw the spectrum for just the you know 18 pulse drive i still have my fundamental by the way what's the fundamental doing that's what's doing the work the harmonics are kind of extra currents that are part of the process of converting from ac to dc and we have to live with them. So if you have less harmonics to start with, 17th and 19th, all these other ones go away. That's why, you know, we look at certain applications and we say, um, at some point I might want to go with an 18 pulse drive because, you know, you know, even though it might cost a little bit more out, out of the gate, I might not have to deal with the harmonics after the fact. So we look at, you know, where can I take advantage of, um, you know, Higher, higher pulse numbers and so forth. And I can do that with within the individual drive itself um, and or using phase shifting transformers as an example. Got it. And uh, hopefully that, that helps Ardath. But um, Dan, I, I wanna kind of dig into something a little bit more. So if you pick the right drive and equipment and gear right out of the gate, you can actually use less corrective equipment later. So we're really digging into the question of is this a retrofit or is this a new build? Um, can you kind of expand a little bit more about if you would um, diagnose the situation differently one way or the other and, and what your approach for each of those would be? Yeah, that actually, Josh, that's a good follow-up um, because what I find is like a lot of times designers will come to me and say, hey, am I going to have a problem with this? And this goes back to those kind of, you know, oh, I have a 20% more of my, you know, transformer capacity. Am I going to have problems? I mean, they, there's no guarantees with harmonics in terms of magnitudes and certain systems, you really have to look at it from a system level. Um, but yeah, so when you start to think about the solutions, if you pick the right drive out of the gate, you know, you could end up having less, um, you know, uh, filtering and, and so forth later. So one of the things we addressed in the paper was kind of around the, the whole, you know, individual drive approach versus system approach. And so that really does kind of go into those kind of things. And, and again, it's a technical and economic choice. Let me I'll show you an example here. So if I, um, so if I have my source and my transformer, and again, I'm running this as a simplified case, but if I have a bunch of drives here and, um, and I'm creating some harmonic distortion and I, and I start to you know, mess up my voltage distortion here, and maybe I wanna transfer over to a generator. Um, what we've seen in the past is you, know, you have a generator here and when you're running on the normal source, this, this utility source is, you know, transformer is 5.75% or, you know, something like that. Generator impedance coming back, looking into that is 18%. So as I look at, you know, what am I going to do to take care of the harmonic issue? Well, maybe when I'm running on my normal source, it looks like that. But when I'm running on my generator source, you know, my voltage distortion really gets kind of crazy. And the reason is because remember going back to Ohm's law, um, you know, voltage distortion equals current distortion times harmonic impedance. And if the harmonic impedance here is three times on the generator as it is on the transformer, guess what? If I put a single solution in here, then all the harmonic current goes here, no matter which source I'm on. So sometimes the answer is corrected on the, you know, on, on the system level. Um, and again, this is drawn as one drive, but this could very well be 10 MCCs full of drives. Um, so looking at it from that standpoint, the other thing is, let's say I did have a, uh, you know, I didn't want to have to deal with this after the fact. If I make this 18 pulse, you know, 90% of the time, I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, sometimes we do passive filters. Sometimes we do active filters. 
active filters actually look at the current going through the system. And an active filter is um, like, your, like your cell phone has noise cancellation. Basically, it injects equal and opposite frequencies. So if the harmonics coming out of the driver going this way, the active filter sends them that way. And again, since current flows in a loop, it goes out and back. And, and you know, as far as the bus goes, the voltage goes back to, to normal. So yeah, lots of different things to think about um, related to that, but it can be an individual drive solution or a uh, system solution. And let me just add one more thing to that. Let's say this is a water treatment plant. Let's say you had 10 drives across here. Okay, so I'll, I'm gonna start actually over here. Um, let's say you have your source and you have 10 drives. Well, one of the things you could do is you could put a filter on every single drive, okay? And I won't draw them all out, but if you end up with a filter on every drive, you know, so you have a drive plus a harmonic filter, that adds a little bit of cost to every drive, but it might be the right way to do it. Now, what if you had five drives that are running all the time and five redundant ones? Well, you basically have five filters that are sitting there with nothing to do half the time. So now that, that might be where a system level, like an active filter. So even if an active filter costs more to begin with, you might actually put it on a system level and still be able to deal with the problems on many drives instead of one drive. I, I don't know if Josh, if that helps to kind of clarify it a little bit better. But. So the real question is, do you want to put the active filter in, put the extra cost up front, or do you want to do it in service calls and you're adding an active filter to somewhere between five and 10 drives if you've got redundant in that particular situation? Yeah. So let me ask one more quick follow-up to you. You mentioned uh, having a main power source and a generator power source. So let, let's think of a scenario where you decide sometime down the road after the building was built originally that you need to have a backup generator. Um, what are the things that you're, you're thinking about? I mean, it seems like you mentioned that the impedance could be different based on the main power source versus the generator. So uh, kind of talk about how you would diagnose that up front as you're doing the generator retrofit. Yeah, and, and what I run into a lot, actually, Josh, is if you have, um, you know, if you do have your generator connected in here, and again, this would be some sort of transfer scheme. So I'll just draw it as if they're both connected in parallel, but um, you'd have a generator here. Again, this is, let's say, just simplified 6%, 18%. Um, and then you have a transfer scheme with, with breakers or contactors or whatever. And, and then, you, you know, you feed your loads down here. Um, so if you had, if you had no generator, but you added one later and you had a whole bunch of, um, harmonic producing loads. And again, we're going to call harmonic producing loads kind of the new normal, anything electronic, but specific to today, we're talking about drives. Um, but you have all these VFDs or other things that are adding harmonics to the system and they want to flow back to the path of least impedance. If the generator is offline, that current is going to flow back up to the source. And by the way, um, it's going to flow out, say, for example, on A and then back on B and C. A lot of people think harmonics flow to ground, but they don't. They flow out on the phase conductors and back on the other phases or the neutral. Um, but anyway, so as we, as we send the currents out um, and then we switch over to the generator, so we, we take this out and we run over here to the generator, um, sometimes we'll have problems. And like I said, maybe we go from a voltage distortion that looks somewhat bad, you know, to something that looks horrible. And, it, and when I say horrible, I mean, it could get really ugly pretty fast. Cause you, again, you got three times the impedance and what's that going to cause? You might actually have what we call multiple zero crossings. I'll, I'll explain a couple of scenarios with that, but, but you could have a bad voltage distortion. So by cleaning up the harmonics here, this goes back to normal. And what's really interesting, Josh, you, you kind of made me think of something. What do people usually test a generator with? They'll bring in a resistive load bank and they'll test it with a resistor. Well, of course, if you have a linear voltage and you have a linear current, you have no distortion, it's gonna look fine. And then they have a real scenario where the power goes out and they're running on the generator and they have a problem. So this is something that I have run into a lot um, and, and people need to deal with. What I mentioned over here with multiple zero crossings is I had an example where somebody was using a welding line and in an auto plant and they were you know running the, um, the stamping presses were causing enough voltage distortion on on the system to cause the welder instead of being you know eight cycle or 20 cycles long the weld was eight cycles they were counting a nice way to keep track of time by the way is if you're looking at a sine wave every time it crosses zero here and then you know back here again that happens to be 16.67 milliseconds 
Well, if it crossed there and here and maybe over here again, now every time it crosses zero, it thinks that 16.67 milliseconds. So the welding line that was supposed to be 20 times that was only getting eight times that. Never get out, they were having bad welds and stuff. So again, harmonic problems are a little bit difficult to track down after you have this issue because it's not always just like something overheats and burns up. It's something over time heats and burns up or this misoperation thing is a little bit intermittent. Like sometimes it does it, sometimes it doesn't. So again, the, the things with the generators and especially with voltage distortion that gets pretty bad can be um, difficult to track down, but also, um, you know, it, it, it again follows that simple rule of electricity, which is Ohm's law. Yeah, and your uh, weld situation that you bring up, there's a strong possibility that you don't find out you had a bad weld until a little ways down the uh, path when whatever you were welding was actually installed and the the customers coming back to you saying you know what, what are you doing <laughs> well there's actually a recall on a on an actual part on a car i won't tell you specifics but it, yeah because of that and so yeah that's that's one of those things you're exactly right you wouldn't know it we call that product quality as a result of power quality right so that's that can happen in a lot of different scenarios got it okay so i'm going to jump into another facebook question here um, and this one's from Preston and it says, we have a facility with drives on almost everything. The incoming transformer is a 2,500 KVA Y, uh, it says Y, Y I'm thinking they're meaning a Y Delta. Um, but it's 7.2 slash 12.47 KV to 277, 480, lots of harmonics on utility, but they disappear when transferred to the generator. So, I mean, it sounds like, a pretty similar scenario to what we were talking about using generators. Um, so let, let me know if you caught everything that I said. There. I think so. So 1247, 2500 KVA, um, lots of harmonics, everything on here is on drives. Um, you know, so they're running everything and, and he says they disappear. The harmonics disappear when they go on generator. Um, I don't know if he means specifically, maybe you could have a follow-up question, but um, so the current, again, has to flow somewhere. So the current's gonna typically flow out and back on the transformer all, out to all the different drives. So if, if we transfer to the generator, we would have the same thing. If the generator's running in parallel, likely a lot of the harmonics will still go back to the utility as that's a lower impedance in terms of current. Now, as far as voltage goes, um, what he may be saying is it runs a lot better on the generator. They, you know, the opposite could be true in terms of impedance. Remember we said this is Z is uh, you know 5.75, if for some reason he had a very large generator here, um, you know, it's, it's a comparable thing. So if this was, let, let's just exaggerate it, say 10 MVA, you know, 10 MVA would be four times bigger than that. So even though the impedance is, is bigger in terms of 18%, the effective impedance would be 2,500 divided by 10,000 times, you know, 18. So you end up with, um, you know, you end up with something that's going to be closer or actually less than the original impedance. So I'll, I'll follow up with you. Um, did you say Preston? So um, Josh, I think I can follow up with a specific around that question or if he wants to follow up with an answer, but um, generally harmonic currents have to flow. That's just a natural thing of the, of the system. Now, the other thing that could happen is let's say this generator is very small. The current from the this is actually an interesting phenomenon that happens. The current from the system could look like this when you look at the harmonics on the drives. And then when it's run on the generator, if it has really, really high impedance, it actually could look like this. And so he may actually be squashing out his harmonics by having such a high impedance here that this looks like a line reactor in front of, the, in front of all the drives. So lots of things, it's a very dynamic situation can go on, um, but that, that would be, you know, a couple guesses and then I can, I can follow back up with, with Preston. Yep. Diagnose, diagnose, diagnose. And uh, don't forget the Eaton electrical services and systems team is also available to help uh, talk through some of this and keep in mind, we have the white paper coming as well. And Josh, uh, I'll just, yeah, that's a really good point. So one of the things you do want to do, it sounds like he's been taking some measurements. So measurements are really the key. So diagnosing that with measurements is, is really important. Got it. Oh, and, oh, and that, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you, but it goes back to the question you asked me earlier, which is how do you know new system versus old system? I think I forgot to answer that part of it, which is on a new system, you have to model on an old system you can measure. And that's, that's really, it's a lot easier on, a, on an existing system to figure out what's going on versus on a new system, but, but you can do it on both. 
Got it. And uh, did have a follow up. It is why, why. And so it looks like he answered most of those questions. And if um, he does come back with anything else, you can pop that up to the top as well. Uh, next one I'm going to go to is LinkedIn. And this is Ibrahim, Ibrahima on LinkedIn. And his question is, what is the impact of the other harmonic into the system? And so an example is the first, second, and third harmonic. Um, you were talking about being tested on the mass. So let's uh, go back to that again. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's, let's do this. Um, Ibrahim. So that this is okay. If we look at the fundamental 60 Hertz, and then we look at, let's say the second harmonic, which is going to be, you know, twice as fast. And then we look at the third harmonic, which, you know, all those, um, what we can do is there's actually, I don't know if anybody's done, this is, this is a power systems thing, but there's a thing called sequence, um, positive, negative, and zero sequence. So, Positive sequence is what we think about for 60 hertz. So positive sequence is, you know, A followed by B followed by C. They're 120 degrees apart. They rotate this way and, and they kind of form, uh, you know, so phase A is there, phase B is here, and then phase C is actually here. And so those three phases added up again, we say would add up to zero, but that's a three phase system positive sequence. There's a neat, neat kind of thing that happens. When you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, we'll just go there. It goes positive, negative, zero, positive, negative, zero, positive, negative, zero, positive, et cetera. Okay. Positive sequence harmonics, which this one, this one, this one, this one, they act like the 60 Hertz stuff. Negative sequence harmonics are kind of like um, a, B, C, um, we talk about, um, let, let's say for a motor, we have a motor that spins and the, and the 60 Hertz is making it spin this way. The, the negative sequence harmonics kind of make the motor want to spin the opposite way. So when you have a lot of, let's say you have a system and I have you know, enough voltage distortion on my bus here, even across the line motor might see you know, a voltage that looks like that, which means it's going to draw a current into it that might be say for example negative harmonic like which is the fifth harmonic so i'm creating you know maybe with some bfds over here harmonic currents that are going out and i'm screwing up my bus voltage and then that negative sequence harmonic current comes into this motor makes it want to spin backwards it's kind of like driving with your foot all the way to the floor in the gas pedal and kind of like tapping your brakes a little bit it's very inefficient so the forward motion um, doesn't allow the motor to spin as fast as it would want, and it makes it less efficient, heats it up, you can have premature damage and failure of motors. So that's negative sequence harmonics work like that. Zero sequence harmonics we kind of addressed earlier, and they add up in the neutrals. And so now you can have overheating in the neutrals to the point where you can have double the current in the neutral as you do on the phases. So going back to our earlier example, phase A, B, C, A, B, C, neutral, I could have 10 amps of say 60 Hertz, 10 amps, we'll go with 10 amps of each in this case, 10 amps, 10 amps, 10 amps, 10 amps, 60 and 10 amps of let's say third harmonic or any of the zero sequence. And usually we talk about the odd um, multiples of the third. So third, ninth, sixth isn't usually very common. But anyway, what we would have is on the neutral out here, we would have zero amps of 60 Hertz, as we mentioned before, 60 Hertz, A, B, C adds up to zero, but the third harmonics, A, B, C, 10 plus 10 plus 10 is gonna add up to 30 amps on the neutral. Now, if you look at what this, this phase wire is, is gonna be rated here, it's gonna have 10 amps plus 10 amps, but you do that in an RMS fam, uh, fashion. So it's 10 squared plus 10 squared, and that's going to be 14.1 amps. That's square root of two, by the way. So, so 10, 10 squared plus 10 squared, it's 14 amps on phase A. That could be a 20 amp wire, you know, 12 gauge wire. If I use 12 gauge wire on my neutral, it's only rated for 20 amps. I have 30 amps, so I'm going to burn up my neutrals. That's why they double the neutrals. So zero sequence harmonics add up on the neutrals. And they, and we talked about it earlier um, with the question about the media voltage and, and 480 volt systems where 
maybe high frequency ones I mentioned 39th harmonic. So if you keep expanding this list out, you get to 39th, it's going to be zero sequence. Positive sequence harmonics just add extra current to the system. It's like adding extra, um, you know, load on your wires and it, and it can kind of overheat things. Um, negative sequence kind of tends to make things want to go backwards. Zero sequence tends to, you know, add up again in, in a way. And by the way, these, these also rotate as, as vectors or phasers, but they rotate together. So when you add them up on the neutral, all three of them add up exactly in phase with each other, if I could draw it correctly. And so what you end up with is three times the current, the neutral. So that whole discussion really um, goes, goes to the fact that like each of the harmonics or characteristic harmonics have sort of different patterns to them. And um, if, you, if you look at BFDs, we say six pulse, you know, we already said fifth, seventh, 11th, 13th, eight, you know, 12 pulse, we could figure that out, 18 pulse, we could figure that out. Um, but like fluorescent lights or LEDs or um, maybe a three phase rectifier, you know, for vehicle charging, for example, you know, that might have fifth, seventh, whatever. This might have third, fifth, you know, third, fifth, seventh. LEDs might have third, fifth, seventh, you know, but they might be a different spectrum, a different pattern. The nice thing about harmonics is they're pretty predictable um, in terms of the characteristic harmonics, meaning the signature associated with each type of harmonic. So hope that helps answer the question a little bit. Got it. Got it. Next question I'm going to jump to. This is on um, LinkedIn, and this one comes from Ray. I know that you mentioned the regulation earlier, but let's talk IEEE 519. So maybe just get into what is it, uh, how do you use it, and why does it matter? Um, did you say Ray, Josh? Yeah. So Correct, Ray. Um, so, Ray, so, um, Ray, that's a great question. And 519 is an important, uh, you know, an important topic around harmonics. Um, you know, when we think about the voltage and current distortion that either our loads create or our neighbor's loads create, the current distortion is going to cause heating and, and other things in our system. So we kind of have to think about that and how we're going to affect ourselves. Um, if that current goes back out onto the power system, it may actually affect our neighbors a little bit through the transformers that we use in common with the utility. But if we screw up the voltage at the, cusp, at the, uh, at the utility level, now we have to deal with that it's going to be more complicated. And um, so again, the utility is the mediator, we'll call them. And we, we say that that point where everything comes together is the point of common coupling, the point where one customer shares, a, a, you know, the source from the utility with another customer. And the 519 standard actually is, um, it's interesting. I have it, um, you, you can kind of look it up, but it's, it's a, uh, it's about a 20 page document. And, you know, when it first came out in 1982, roughly, um, it, you know, they, they added a whole bunch of information into it. And they, they for a long time, they, for about 10 years, they worked on reviving it and re redesigning it a little bit. And in 1992, they re redid it again. And um, it's one of those things that you think should be updated pretty frequently, but it wasn't updated for a long time until 2014 was the last revision. And that's the one we're using today. But they went from about a hundred page document down to about 20 pages. And they try to be very prescriptive in terms of what they're doing with that. So um, if you have, again, a single utility source and let's say multiple customers or multiple transformers that are fed off the same source, sometimes you end up with basically a, uh, uh, what, what would be the harmonics coming from one customer affecting, you know, let's say in a VFD scenario, something like that affecting hey, another real customer. quick can we pull up his uh drawing oh, sorry. On, on the screen yep. as well yeah sorry go on yes so so as these harmonics come out of this system here again if i'm and there's always transformers back through the system so if this current is affecting this transformer it might actually cause damage to that and this customer could see it so this is customer one and customer two um so there's tables in the ieee 519 standard that basically define the current distortion that you're allowed to push up through your system and the voltage distortion that you're allowed to create at the common point, at the point of common coupling. So sometimes it's on the primary of the transformer, sometimes it's on the secondary, it depends. But um, when you think about it, um, it's all related more to voltage than current. And people say, well, why would you say that? And it really becomes this. Um, the, they, they use this term, we, we use a term called ITHD. What's ITHD? It's total harmonic distortion. That's 
the sum of all the harmonics, second squared plus third squared plus, you know, I four squared, you know, dot, 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 whatever, divided by the fundamental, the 60 Hertz. That's THD, total harmonic distortion. And any given time you can calculate that. With the IEEE 519 standard, they change that to ITDD, total demand distortion. And what that means is everything on the top is relatively the same, except you're using kind of a worst case scenario demand. And then this is the demand um, situation when you're at your peak. Um, so you might have really light distortion, or let's say in terms of amps overnight, but the THD could be very high but your TDD is what's important. So how badly are you screwing up the current on the system according to the size of the system? And remember the 20% reference I gave earlier, let's say your, you know, your load on your transformer or this transformer is you know, 50% of its capacity. So they're gonna let you produce less. So the ITDD limit is based on your um, short circuit KVA. Um, so the short circuit, um, amps, I guess, and it's based on your, your load. And the ratio of those two determines um, how much of a, of a, of, of a level will allow you to. And most of the time it's between 5% and 20% distortion. So when you look at TDD values in the IEEE standard, that really says, I can't screw it up more than you know, five to 20% in that range. Now, if you look at an 18 pulse drive, most of the times you're going to be below that 5%. So that's where going back, Josh, to the, the original question is that we talked about, you, you don't even have to deal with it at that point because it already kind of quote unquote complies with that. But when people say comply, that's a, a little bit of a interesting thing because we're not really, the way that the standard is written is you only comply at the point of common coupling. So people sometimes use it down in the system and we could talk about that more if you want. But um, The voltage distortion levels, the part that it's really referring to more importantly is VTHD here, usually, you know, it, that goes by voltage level. So if I'm at 480, for example, that's the one change that was made from, two, um, from 1992 to 2014, and it went from 5% THD to 8% THD. And what they found was you didn't have to be quite as clean on most power systems at 480, so you could allow a little bit more voltage distortion. Um, but, and again, there's no magic number. Like, so as soon as you get to 8.2% distortion, you know, everything is going to start failing, but those are guide, guide, guidelines. And the key word there is kind of recommended practice. So I don't see the utilities kind of like going out and jumping on people and saying, Hey, you have to do this proactively, but you know, when there is a problem, like the ski lift we gave earlier, um, you know, they can be a little bit more proactive about it, trying to, trying to fix those problems. So does that kind of, Hopefully yeah, I, I think that definitely gets into the IEEE uh, thing that I noticed more than anything is I, I always kind of had the impression that regulations like that changed on a very frequent basis. So it's kind of nice to know that there's been a level of consistency and they've also tried to bring clarity by making the, the actual publication a little bit shorter. Uh, so I'm going to get into two questions here that I think we can have you relate just to make sure that we hit as many as possible. Um, so Ashish from LinkedIn asks, um, what's an active filter and how can we address these harmonics in real time? And then Vinay on LinkedIn also asks, what are the losses that occur in a filter? So I, I think we're talking filtration. Okay. Um, I'm going to start over here with my drawing. Um, and what I'll do is let's talk about an active filter again first. So um, let's say you have, and I'm just going to draw it now as simplified form is just a constant current source. So no matter what your harmonic source is out here, we're going to say there's a certain amount of harmonics coming out of there. And that could be a combination of things. It could be, let's say it's a six pulse drive. So maybe I have a hundred amps of fifth harmonic current. I could have, you know, 30 amps of seventh harmonic current. And I could have 10 amps of 11th harmonic current, and I could have five amps as an example of 13th harmonic current. Okay, current, as we mentioned, is gonna flow out and flow back. And one of the things that I think is very important to understand is current has to flow in a loop. So no matter what, it's gonna flow in a loop. So if current is created, meaning we allow that drive or that load to create the current, it's gonna flow in the loop and come back. So where does current want to flow? It wants to flow the path of least impedance. And in this case, it only has one path. So it flows out on phase A back on B and C, for example. 
if I put a standard harmonic filter in, I mentioned this earlier, um, as, as in, and it kind of glossed over a little bit, but basically what you do is you tune this filter. And if you look at a frequency spectrum of that, you look at basically something that looks like this. There's, if this is impedance and this is frequency, um, you have a point where that filter looks almost like very, very close to zero. Now it's not really zero because there's a little bit of resistance in here. So let's, let's address that in terms of losses. If I push current through that path, first of all, only the current that's kind of around this frequency here wants to flow through that path because as you look at the impedance, the impedance quickly is high here and high here. So the fifth harmonic filter, fifth harmonic is here, seventh is here, say 11th is here. You're gonna get you know a decent amount of fifth through it. So maybe instead of 100 amps going there, maybe you have 50 amps here and 50 amps there. Um, and then you would determine the losses in that, which is going to be minimal because that resistance is fairly small. But you're not going to get rid of much of the 7th, much of the 11th or the 13th. So they're going to want to still flow back in the system. The, the, the benefit, though, is the 5th is the biggest one. So we can get rid of that in a, in a fairly simple way. But this, is, this takes a little bit more design, and you have to make sure that it's not going to be overloaded in the future. And honestly, the main benefit of, of, of harmonic filter, believe it or not, is not harmonic filtering, power factor correction. So you size it usually for power factor, and then you get the benefit of harmonics. So we can talk about that more, but this is really kind of the key. Now, if I, if I don't have this kind of filter, and let's, let's just take this out for a second, I put an active harmonic filter in here. Active filter. Okay, now what does an active filter do? An active filter senses what's the current coming through the system. And, and a lot of times it'll sense it here with, you know, um, CTs on that main incoming line. And then what it'll do is it'll inject equal and opposite currents this way. So if currents flow in this way and this way, say out on phase A, back on B and C, out on phase A, back on B and C, where these two meet, again, it's like noise cancellation in my earphones here or in your cell phone it basically cancels it out. So this fifth harmonic here, if it's hundred amps going this way, it literally could put hundred amps going this way and cancel it out. And so what you see back here then is zero amps. And the really nice thing about that is you could do that at multiple different frequencies. So essentially you could get it for all these frequencies. And again, if you think about like the benefit of that, it's huge. But as we talk about the paper, this is also the most expensive solution. So you think about, can I, you know, if I had, remember going back to the, the example where we had 10 drives and five of them had filled, you know, five of them were running all the time and five of them weren't, you don't know which five are going to run. So maybe an active filter is still cheaper than putting a single filter or multiple filters on the system. Um, but, but does that, so that kind of gives sort of an overview of how active filters work. Um, but, but, the other part of that addressing losses are what does this thing do? It injects current. And the way it injects current is through a power converter. And this thing has losses. So let's say you measure um, not current up here, but let's say you measure power kilowatts. And let's say your load was, you know, 150 kilowatts. And you, you have all your harmonic current on there and you turn off your active filter at 150 kilowatts. And then you turn on your active filter um, your kilowatts actually will go up a little bit. And the reason they go up a little bit is because the current that you're taking out of here is not really real um, power, like kilowatts. It's, it's similar to reactive power in the sense that it's um, distortion power. Um, and, it, and what it turns out to be is as that current's going through the system and getting corrected by this one, this actually might have, let's say, you know, two to five kilowatts of losses. So my my power that I measure on my system with that active filter on is 150, say 155 kilowatts with that on. So, you know, your current originally looked like this in terms of very distorted. And what you're gonna end up with is a really nice clean sine wave and power factor corrected and everything, but you're gonna pay for it with a little bit of losses. So get rid of harmonics, add a little bit of losses, but the benefit is there. Um, and, and again, it's sort of a system level thing, which is what kind of one of the things we address in the paper. Got it. Okay. Uh, next question that I want to ask, this one comes from Bob on LinkedIn and 
the question is regarding high order harmonics. Do you see any specific high order harmonics that tend to be more damaging than others? I, I mean, that one is one of those things that's kind of system specific. Um, I think going back to the earlier question that we talked about um, because of capacitance. So all power systems have inductance and capacitance. So when you do have higher order harmonics, depending on those capacitive paths, um, think about the impedance of a capacitor. And when I say capacitive paths, I'm talking through air, you know, power conductors that have capacitance to ground or capacitance to other cables. Um, when you think about a capacitor, it's one over two pi times the frequency times the capacitance. And so as the, if you have a fixed capacitance, as the frequency goes up, the impedance of that path goes down. So what's gonna happen is high frequency currents can follow those paths. Now, if it's zero sequence, those are the ones that tend to find those ground paths that we talked about earlier. And, you know, so 39th or 45th or whatever the odd multiples of the thirds way up there. Um, but as you look at like, let's say 17th and 19th harmonic, usually those magnitudes are so small that they're not really as, as effective on, you know, causing damage or problems with, with equipment on the system um, as, as nearly as much as um, the low order harmonics like fifth, seventh, you know, and 11th and 13th or third harmonic on single phase systems. All right. It looks like we have one more question. We got time for one more question. So I'm going to ask one that I think is, is going to be fairly quick. Um, this is uh, Dora Mani from LinkedIn. And the question is, what's the difference between THD and TDD? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll draw this out on a different sheet here. So we go TH. And again, the TDD really gets addressed in the 519 standard. So THD, um, is going to be like all of your harmonics squared um, divided by the fundamental. So, and again, you can do this for voltage or current, but most of the time we're doing, in this case, we're doing, sorry, for TDD, we're only talking about current. So let's say we're, we're gonna use a, an example where we have fundamental 100 amps, you know, third harmonic, 30 amps, fifth harmonic, say 12 amps, Seventh harmonic would be say four amps and 11th harmonic will be two amps or whatever. So this is fundamental, third, fifth, seventh, say 11th. Okay. So the fundamental here is a hundred amps. If I take a um, 30 squared, so I get 900 and I take plus 12 squared, I get 144, I take four squared, 16, and I take two squared, I get four. Um, what you'll notice right away is when you square these terms, the biggest ones really become the predominant ones. So I'm not going to, I don't have my calculator handy, but if I calculate this out, I would guess that you're going to get somewhere in a 30, say like, I don't know, 33, say amps. I'm just going to guess it. It's not really that relevant for the exact numbers here, but I'm going to say, once you take this, add it together and you take the square root, say you get 33. Um, sorry, 33 divided by 100. So we multiply that by 100% and we get 33% THD, okay? Now, remember earlier I mentioned if you were running overnight um, and, and you had like a light load condition, you might have a higher percent THD. What can happen is, let's say the fundamental overnight goes to 50 amps, but mostly the rest of it stays the same. So THD, you could have, you know, 33 divided by 50. And now guess what my THD is, 66%. And so you would say, is this number worse than this number? And this is where THD can get you in trouble. It, it's really the same. The same amount of harmonic current is flowing through my power system and heating up my equipment and whatever in actual amps. And actual amps are the most important part, okay? So what TDD TDD tries to attempt is to try to make sure that you're using the maximum demand number so that you're not artificially giving a THD that's way high. And so, um, so most of the time, let's say your maximum demand was 200 amps. So now your actual uh, THD would be, you know, 33 divided by 200. And that could be roughly, you know, 16.5% demand so, or TDD. And so 
going through all that, and what I mentioned earlier was the 519 standard says I could never go above 20%. This number would be within the 20%, and we would have to carefully look at that, see if it makes sense. This number is above, this number is above. But honestly, they don't, they're all okay. the same amount of harmonic current. So, hey, Sorry, Dan, I, I, Dan, I hate, hate, to, hate to do this, but we are at a point where we really do need to uh, keep this going. We are at the end of our time. Um, we are going to keep answering questions. So anybody that didn't get their, answer, their question answered, we will be following up. But what I want to do right now is pause and show on a screen a QR code. So what I need everybody to do is open the camera on your phone or your smart device, your tablet, whatever it is that you, you have in your hands, point the camera to the code that's on your screen, and you're gonna see something pop up that's gonna take you to a link. It'll ask you if you want to accept that, please do. And it'll take you to the spot where you can download the application notes that we talked about earlier. And so we're gonna leave this up for just a moment. So, you know, please again, scan the QR code and it'll take you to, to get that. And we will post this code on the event page at the end of the broadcast. So please make sure that you go to that. And to learn more about harmonics and how to address the issue, visit eaton.com slash harmonics. And that's eaton.com slash harmonics. And I do want to thank not only Eaton Nation for showing up with all these great questions, but also I want to thank Dan for joining me today and uh, just invite everybody to come back next week for or next month. Sorry for our next uh, Ask the Expert live. And hey, everybody a have lot, a Josh. good day. I really appreciate it. All the work you're doing. Thanks.